Oi, pessoal, eu sou Mauro, economista do Porquê. Hoje a gente não está aqui para falar de economia, mas é um assunto que está muito relacionado à economia. E a gente, daqui para frente, vai começar a falar bastante sobre política, sobre eleições, com as eleições aqui no Brasil chegando. A gente está aqui com o professor Steven Levitsky, e ele tem um livro, um livro novo, interessante, sobre democracia, se chama How Democracy Dies. E é um livro sobre os Estados Unidos, e hoje a gente vai falar um pouco sobre o livro e puxar um pouco a conversa para o Brasil. Eu sou o Vladimir, também trabalho no Porquê, vim ajudar aqui com essa entrevista. Eu sou Steve, autor de How Democracies Die. É, obrigado. <laughs> ok, we turn to English now. <laughs> so, I want to start with a very basic and important question. Here in Brazil, we see you like a, a lot of people are tired with democracy. They say it's not working for them, it works for just a few people, a few politicians, and people who are connected with these politicians. Some people look, at, look back at the dictatorship, dictatorship period, and they say, oh, the, those are the good, the good days. They don't mind to bring the, the military again and, and have them, they run the, the, the country. Why democracy is so important and we need to stand for it? Well, everybody's got uh, different views, I guess, about why democracies matter. I think one thing that's really important to point out is um, that the authoritarian alternatives, um, if you look at, the, at all the countries in the world, if you look at, at the performance of all democracies and dictatorships across mm -hmm. the world, dictatorships don't solve problems any more than mm -hmm. democracies. It's certainly true that the Brazilian dictatorship in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, uh, presided over a period of rapid economic that's growth. True. And, uh, and jobs, and you're right, less violence. Um, and that's always a danger. The nostalgia for an authoritarian past mm -hmm. is, is always a danger in, in, in many, many societies. And it doesn't mean those things are related, right? The uh, regime right. and growth. Right, no, it's, uh, there's pretty good evidence. Mm -hmm. Economists and political scientists have done a large number of studies that have found that um, authoritarian regimes do not per, uh, generate more economic growth. They certainly don't um, combat corruption better than democracies. Mm -hmm. Usually, most dictatorships are worse on the front of, of corruption. So um, the, the idea that a dictatorship, that the military coming to power, that a strong man coming to power would somehow solve our problems is almost certainly a myth. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. So what does democracy do in a positive way? I mean, sometimes we have, I think, too high expectations for democracy. When countries first make a transition, to democracy as, uh, say, Argentina and Chile and Brazil did in the 1980s is a tendency to think that with democracy, all mm -hmm. good things will come. We'll have jobs, we will eat better, we'll have better health care, we'll have justice, we'll end injustice, and um, we'll end corruption, and that's just not true. Mm -hmm. Democracy does a couple of things. Democracy means that citizens have a peaceful way of removing governments they don't like every four or five years. Mm -hmm. Democracy means that uh, the government will not shoot people for having uh, a particular views, mm -hmm. which is important. Democracy means that if I, as a citizen, want to speak out against the government, if I want to publish against the government, if I, if I want to read information that's against the government, I have a right to do that, mm -hmm. which uh, many people, certainly I, value a lot. Um, but that's it. We can change our government peacefully. Sure. We can criticize the government and take any position we want mm -hmm. with, without violence from the state. Um, beyond that, we shouldn't have too high expectations. I think the danger is we expect so much from sure. democracy, mm -hmm. and then when democracy doesn't deliver mm -hmm. justice and the end of racism uh, and uh, health care for all and the end of corruption, we grow disappointed. Mm -hmm. Citizens grow disappointed. Mm -hmm. we, we wanted to hear about the relation between um, populism and authoritarianism. So is there a tendency for populist governments to uh, entrench themselves in power and become authoritarian, or uh, is are those things related? They are. They're they're related in a complicated way because at at some instance, populism is very democratic. Populism comes about when a majority of citizens are very frustrated with the political elite, uh, when they're angry at the political elite, when they believe that the political elite hasn't listened to them hasn't responded to them, has excluded them, in some cases has, has treated them with, with derision. So people are angry. A majority of people are angry. And populists, successful populists, 
are those who go out and convince the people that they will go and destroy the political elite on behalf of the people, a people that's really angry at the elite. And so when a populist is first elected, it's usually a very democratic moment in the sense that this guy, it's usually a guy, um, represents the majority of the electorate. The problem is that, and, and we've studied a, a large number of cases of populism, both in Latin America and elsewhere, most populists, when they win, when they come to power in a democracy, then go on to assault mm -hmm. democratic institutions. They tend uh, to get into conflict with the Congress, to get into conflict with the courts, and that very, very often ends up in an institutional crisis. Sure. And uh, very, very often, particularly when the populist is popular, a, uh, an effort very often successful by the populist to, to dismantle or weaken democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. So Juan Perón was one classic example of this. Uh, per, uh, Argentina was a, was a very new and weak democracy, but Perón was elected democratically and then uh, governed in an authoritarian manner. Hugo Chavez is another classic case of a populist who was elected democratically, mm -hmm. uh, but who over time dismantled democratic institutions with majority support. Uh, Alberto Fujimori is another case in Peru of a populist. Uh, I would say Rafael Correa in, in Ecuador as well. So most populists, unfortunately, uh, although their origins are really profoundly democratic, end up trampling on liberal democratic institutions. And usually, sometimes they don't want to do that, right? They, beforehand. Right. So there are some. They get frustrated. There are some. So many populists are outsiders. They're um, they're people who've never governed or never they haven't been in politics before. They've never governed before. They're very inexperienced. Mm -hmm. uh, Alberto Fujimori in Peru is an example of this. He was a uh, college professor who was unknown in Peru. Had never been in politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Donald Trump, my president, is another case of that. Uh, has never been in, in politics before. So they don't have some big plan. They come in, they get elected, they use a populist discourse because they discover that it works, mm -hmm. that bashing the elite is very popular, it helps them win. Uh, and then they come to power and they have no idea what they're doing. But they just spent the entire campaign saying they're going to bury the, the elite. And so the elite, by which I mean opposition parties, sometimes judges, people in Congress, the media, intellectuals, people like me, uh, feel very threatened by these guys mm -hmm. because they just spent months saying how they're going to bury the elite. And so the establishment tends to be very tough on these guys, mm -hmm. very, very critical, de denouncing them, criticizing them, sometimes protesting against them. And their reaction, because they don't have experience, they're not career politicians, they don't have experience dealing with the media, they don't have experience taking criticism, being criticism, uh, criticized by every media source day after day after day, being criticized from Congress, being criticized by the courts. Um, they feel threatened. They feel like they're backed into a corner, and very often they push back. And that's where the, the uh, escalation of, uh, of, of assaulting democratic institutions and sometimes full democratic breakdown happens. How do we as voters can spot them? Well, there's no perfect recipe. Right. Sometimes, uh, sometimes candidates get through the filter. Um, the current prime minister of, of Hungary, Viktor Orban, uh, governed as a, a Democrat a few decades ago, mm -hmm. didn't show a lot of signs of authoritarianism until he got into office. And then, surprise, <laughs> he, was, uh, he was pretty authoritarian. But most of the time, you can identify these guys. We, in our book, in the first chapter, mm -hmm. we develop what we call a litmus test, four criteria, four uh, types of behavior, that if you see a candidate engaging in this behavior, uh, one or more of them, you should worry. You should, you should not vote for them. Um, because most of the time, candidates who engage in this sort of behavior go on to govern in an, un, in an undemocratic way. So Perón, Chavez, mm -hmm. Fujimori, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, all of these guys failed our litmus test. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump too, I should add. Um, the, so the four criteria are not adhering to democratic rules of the game, rejecting democratic rules of the game, promoting or tolerating violence, uh, threatening to curtail the civil liberties of your opponents, including the media, and denying the basic legitimacy of your partisan rivals. If a candidate does one or more of those things, I strongly recommend not voting for them. Okay. We often have 
candidates who um, say that, well, the media, it, it's biased, yeah. it's uh, media yeah. companies are owned by yeah, just a handful families. of uh, families, yeah. so uh, it works in an anti-democratic way, and then they'll often come up with ideas about how to curtail some of uh, media liberties. Yeah, and just to add one thing, mm -hmm. uh, in the terminology of your book, I don't think we have the guardrails in the political system that the U.S. have. So we, ne we need to rely on the media, right? I think every democracy needs to rely on, on the media. Brazil and, and every democracy I know, uh, the, an independent media is, um, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine sustaining a democracy without a, a vigorous, strong, independent media. And politicians hate the media. All politicians hate the media because the media's job Ultimately, in a democracy, I mean, media do lots of things, but in their, their role in a democracy is to uncover dirt uh, of the politicians, mm -hmm. to find the mistakes and to find the abuses, whether it's corruption uh, or, um, or lying um, or any kind of abuse of power. It is the media's job to discover it and to diffuse it, to denounce it. So, of course, all politicians, even honest politicians, hate the media because they feel like the, the media's job is to find negative stuff about the president. That is, um, that's not fun for the government. Mm -hmm. It's not fun for politicians. But it's critical to democracy because democracy, part of democracy, is constraining, controlling the power of the president. In a presidential system, particularly one like Brazil, the presidency is very, very powerful. And so it, it, no democracy can survive if there are not um, institutions, the media, the courts, the Congress, that limit the power of the president. The job of the media is to limit the power of the president and to make sure that if the president uh, violates the trust of voters, breaks the law, engages in abuses, or just simply lies, mm -hmm. that the people know about it, that citizens know about it. So yes, all politicians are going to to complain about the media, even fully democratic politicians. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama used to complain about the bias of the media. Fernando Enrique Cardoso used to complain about the bias of the media. That's very common. Um, but when governments begin to take action to regulate the media or to, to grant the government the ability to punish the media, right. then we should start to worry. What about in an antitrust way? Like you say, the market is very concentrated. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a tough problem. I mean, that that's... Um, the criticisms that are made of the media in Brazil and other Latin American countries are, th they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, the media is very concentrated here. Um, and there have been times, in, and, and uh, Mexico is another place where the media right. is very concentrated. And, um, you know, the media are political actors. Um, mm -hmm. This is not necessarily uh, a, a, a good thing, um, but there, there are times when, when uh, media owners uh, strike up political alliances. They work with a particular party mm -hmm. and not for another one. And so in Mexico, the bulk of the media is aligned with the PRI and to some extent the PAN. It is really to some degree biased against uh, the left. Mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil, certainly in 1989, in the election uh, between yeah, yeah. Kohler and Lula, yeah. the media very clearly lined up behind mm -hmm. Kohler. That's not great. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that the cure, the remedy for that disease, sometimes can be worse than right, the disease itself. Right. And so sometimes there's good reason to promote a pluralization of media, to, to, to engage in, in some sort of anti-monopoly uh, laws. The United States has regulations that, mm -hmm. that ensure that media doesn't become too concentrated. Mm -hmm. So those laws can be legitimate. In fact, Western European democracies all regulate the media that way. Um, but if politicized, if put in the hands of yeah. a government that is intent on cracking down on the media, mm -hmm. um, media regulations can, can be dangerous. What about the internet as an alternative for that? Like you, you can say, oh, the media is concentrated, but you can mm -hmm. go on the internet, there's lots of information there. Mm -hmm. But on the other, other hand, there's no filter, there's not an editor there. So it right. it's spreads fake news all over the place. So it I, does. I want to understand what's, what's your take on that. So it's, it, social media is obviously a, 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 a relatively new phenomenon mm -hmm. that in the, the, and the political consequences of it, I think we're just beginning to learn about. Mm -hmm. So the United States uh, as a society was really totally taken by surprise by the role of fake news and social media in the, in the 2016 election. We weren't ready for it. So this is, 
very, very new. And I think like all media technologies, uh, like radio was and, and mm -hmm. uh, 100 years ago, like, like television was half a century ago, all new media technologies are double-edged. I think there are democratizing elements, mm -hmm. very important elements uh, of social media. It does mean that um, not quite yet, but soon, just about all citizens will have multiple options. They won't have to depend on a single newspaper or a single television station mm -hmm. uh, to get access to information. That's a, that's a positive thing. But you're right. Right now, we have zero filter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people st I still turn to old-fashioned mainstream yeah. media because what, you know, I read in the United States. I read the, the New York Times because I, I value, I trust in their editorial decisions. Right. I do not know what I'm going to get from, from various websites. Now, over time, it pro hopefully will be the case that certain social media will gain reputations, mm -hmm. will gain credibility through their behavior. And already there are some news websites that I know, that I turn to, that I know are reliable. Mm -hmm. But most citizens uh, don't. And, um, and it, it takes a while mm -hmm. for social media to, to gain reputation. So in the meantime, the, our vulnerability to, to, to fake news, to misinformation, also simply just to biased news. Mm -hmm. um, increasingly, as, as you know, this is the case in, in the United States. It's the case in Brazil. Um, whereas the old mainstream media at least uh, made some effort, and uh, I don't know the Brazilian media enough to say, but in the United States, the old mainstream media made some effort to be, uh, to be pluralist, to mm -hmm. present the views of the Democratic and Republican parties, and right. we only have two parties. Um, that's not true mostly with social media. Social media, most of them in politics, uh, have a real uh, partisan slant, a real mm -hmm. ideological point of view. And which is not terrible in and of itself. No. I mean, I think a good citizen would get news from various mm -hmm. uh, different lines. But the tendency, and there's a lot of evidence for this in the United States, is for people just to find new, uh, uh, social media sources that provide information that they already agree with. Information or confirmation, right. Exactly. Yeah. And we begin in the United States, there's a lot of evidence that we've entered mm -hmm. into, into echo chambers in which mm -hmm. we're only reading information that we already agree with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's very dangerous. It makes us worse citizens. Okay. So, um, I wanted to ask you about different ways that an uh, autocratic uh, leader, an elected leader, can uh, try and weaken a democracy. So sure. you mentioned uh, a few of them in your book quite explicitly, so like uh, stuffing courts or shutting down uh, Congress, but here in Brazil, if some of the investigations that are going on are confirmed, what we have seen is a systematic bribing of congressmen by the, the party in power. So using public funds uh, to, to bribe congressmen systematically. How big of a risk is that um, towards weakening democracy? Well, bribing congressmen is not only illegal, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a clear instance of corruption. Uh, and um, it's, it's a very good thing that, it was, it, that it's exposed. It's a good thing that it's punished. And hopefully, Brazilians can take steps to, to make it less likely or less frequent in the future. So there's, um, bribing congressmen is a, is a bad thing. Bribing congressmen is something that's been pretty common in, in developing democracies throughout much of uh, the world. Um, the PT wasn't, didn't invent it in Peru. Uh, excuse me, we had to do that again. Mm -hmm. The PT did not invent it in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's been done by many governments. Uh, American governments have bribed congresspeople. Uh, British governments have bribed uh, members of parliament. It's happened in France, happened a lot in Italy, happened in Spain. It's, it's, it's not good, but it's, it's relatively, it's been common in, in democracies. That, and, and most democracies, most Western democracies uh, eventually grew out of it, reformed their way out of it, um, so that it's less frequent in the United States today than it was 80 years ago. Um, I don't think in Brazil the bribing of congressmen was particularly threatening to democracy. The opposition in, uh, in, in Brazil is sufficiently vibrant. Uh, the, the press, the, the, the economic elite and the opposition parties are sufficiently strong that the PT despite a real economic bonanza and tremendous amount of state resources, 
was not able to tilt the playing field against the opposition. So I, I don't see Brazil to date as, uh, as verging too close to, to authoritarianism. I see it uh, as a practice that's, that's not good for clean government, okay. but that's not a, not, a, not a serious threat to democracy. The, the, the problem in Brazil is it's, Brazil's really hard to govern. Mm -hmm. Brazil, um, there are 35 parties right now in Brazil. Uh, no president ever has a, a majority in Congress. And so initially, but political scientists in the United States who studied Brazil 25 years ago all came to the conclusion that Brazil was ungovernable, that it was, that it was impossible to govern Brazil in democracy because a presidential system combined with this fragmented Congress, it was impossible to, to achieve governability. They were wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazilians invented uh, this system of coalitional presidentialism, particularly under the governments of, of, of Cardoso and Lula. Uh, it worked best under Cardoso. Lula tried to do, so coalitional presidentialism is um, the president comes to power and in order to have a majority in Congress, builds alliances with other political parties. Ideally, they should be like-minded political parties with similar policy goals. And uh, ideally, they should join together for programmatic or political or ideological reasons. But that's not really how it worked in Brazil. In Brazil, uh, and, and I think it was much worse under the Lula government, it was done by either giving parties access to the state. So you get this ministry, and you get to, to fill it up with, uh, give jobs to your supporters, and, and drain the state of resources for political purposes, um, uh, or, or outright bribery. Um, Lula, in particular, tried to build a coalition on the cheap. The PT, which had been out of power for so long, um, and which was a, a real grassroots political party that people who a generation of PT activists, uh, you know, believed that they had been struggling for to, to democratize Brazil for a generation. So they got to power after in 2002 after struggling for a generation mm -hmm. to get to power. They got there and they didn't want to share power with other parties. So what you do in Brazil is you have to share power with other parties. Uh, Lula didn't want to, the, the, P, P, Lula was under a lot of pressure from the PT to give those ministries, give those pieces of the state to the PT. They had earned it. They'd been in the wilderness for 20 years. It was their turn. And so the idea of giving the state out to the PMDB and other parties was not very popular within the PT. So Lula tried initially to build a coalition on the cheap, and he ended up with a very shaky coalition and ended up bribing Congress people. Um, it, it, I don't think it was an effort to authoritarianism. I think it was an effort to govern on the cheap. That was a disastrous failure. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that you don't see Brazil in the brink of authoritarianism. But there are some, if I read your book, if, if I take your book, uh, there are some red flags. Yes. Right. So you have a lot of polarization, mm -hmm. and uh, the powers seem to be overreaching sometimes, and sometimes they it looks like they're playing hardball, in, uh, including the judges. Yeah. So why you don't think they're we're at risk? Well, I think I would say something similar about Brazil that I would say about the United States. Um, which is that until very recently, all, many of us in the United States, including myself, took American democracy for granted. We assumed that no matter what happened, no matter how recklessly our politicians behaved, democracy in the United States was going to survive. I think now in the United States, in the last few years, there are, I don't know if they're red flags, but they're definitely warning signs. Okay. There are reasons why we should worry, we should pay attention, mm -hmm. we should be concerned because American politics has become very polarized and because we're seeing a rise in the United States of hardball politics, of the use of institutions which should be neutral as weapons against opponents. Um, and so there are warning signs and that's why we wrote the book because mm -hmm. we don't think American democracy is dead. We don't even think American democracy is on the brink of death. Okay. But we think that there are reasons to worry. There are warning signs. And so it's very important that we, that, we, that we pay attention and that we take action to make sure that we defend mm -hmm. democracy. I would say something similar about Brazil. Brazil doesn't have the, the history of democratic stability that the United States has. I don't think anybody uh, takes, has taken Brazilian democracy entirely for granted. Mm -hmm. um, but Brazilian democratic institutions worked relatively well, particularly between 1994 mm -hmm. 
and let's say 2010. Um, and, and such that we could be pretty confident. I used to, whenever I was asked about Latin American democracies, I would for years point to Brazil as a success story in Latin America. Peru maybe was a disaster, democracy had collapsed in Venezuela, Ecuador was a mess, Argentina was always a mess. Brazil for many, many years seemed to be doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. But uh, just like the United States, we look at Brazil now and that, like you say, there are, are warning signs. I don't think Brazil is on the brink of democratic death, but we need to pay attention. The level of polarization ha has gotten much, much greater such that the, the, the main parties of the left and right now view each other with great suspicion. They view each other as a, as a serious threat, mm -hmm. which was much less true a decade ago. It's personal, right? Um, I, it seems to be, it's, it's personal, it's partisan, it, it, it's many things. Um, and as you pointed out, I think we're beginning to see in Brazil uh, an increased use of uh, sort of manipulation of institutions, what we call constitutional hardball, the use of, of the letter of the law in ways that kind of challenge or undermine the spirit of the law, uh, mostly in the last four or five years. And these two things go together. As parties polarize, as parties come to really fear one another and fear that if the other side wins, it will be a great disaster for the country or for themselves, they be, they'll be willing to kind of use any means necessary to prevent that from happening. And that's happening in the United States to a degree, and it seems to be happening in, in Brazil. Um, and I think there are, there are more reasons to worry in Brazil because the economic situation yes. is terrible. The, the problem of, of corruption and violence. Uh, and, the, and, and violence are also much worse. I mean, things actually in the United States are, are, are going pretty well. Crime is down, mm -hmm. the economy is growing, unemployment is very low. Um, but here, in addition to this polarization, there's a lot of public disaffection. This is really kind of a perfect storm. So it's a, it's a period where we need to be vigilant and where I think politicians need to be especially careful. Talking to some people who work with us about this interview and I guess uh, what, what we'd like to ask you, something that came up again and again is why should people who feel like a democracy hasn't really given them anything care about democracy and stand up for democracy? So um, I guess what we see uh, young, youngish people mm -hmm. who uh, spend all their adult lives in democratic Brazil, and they don't feel like it's it's something so uh, special. So, um, and since we don't have such a democratic political culture, can that be changed? How? That's a great question, uh, and let me answer in in a couple of ways. Um, first of all. Um, that's a real risk uh, of democracy, particularly when things are not going well, like in the last few years. Many, many citizens may say, look, democracy is delivering nothing to us. Why should we support it? And I think, you know, at some level, you never really value democracy. Now, democracy never becomes special unless you have experienced its absence. In, in some sense, democracy is like oxygen. We don't really, we kind of take it for granted we don't uh, pay much attention to it. We don't value it very much most of the time. Uh, but when we lose it, we realize its importance. Mm -hmm. And I think a generation of Latin Americans in, in Brazil, in Uruguay, in Chile, in Argentina, really came to value democracy when they lost it in, and, uh, in a very violent way in some mm -hmm. countries in the 1960s and, and 70s. And it's, it's a shame that you have to experience a loss of democracy really to value it, but it seems that that is, is sometimes the case. But um, let me answer the question in another way, which is to say, ultimately, it's, it's the responsibility of, of elites, of political leaders, of politicians, of governments, to make sure that democracy matters for people. Um, to, to make sure that they are sufficiently responsible um, and that they govern sufficiently well, um, whether it's honesty or transparency or responsiveness, um, that, that, that people feel the benefits of, of democracy. Sometimes when, when people feel like democracy is offering them nothing, they're right. And, it's, and it can be blamed on, on politicians and parties. So the political elite has a responsibility to, to deliver the goods. And when they fail, um, democracy is imperiled. 
This is, I think, is what happened in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. In uh, at, this is in the in the 1970s, 80s, 1990s. The the dominant parties in Venezuela um, failed to provide even a minimum to the, to their citizens, and it gave rise to Hugo Chavez. And so. I, it's something that Brazilian politicians need to pay a lot of attention to, particularly these days when people's lives are not improving in many parts of the country, uh, when people's lives are in fact getting much worse because of violence, uh, because of unemployment, mm -hmm. because of uh, lack of resources and a, a lack of access to, to social mobility. Um, it's, it's really important that politicians begin to, to send signals to voters mm -hmm. That, that they're listening, that they care, that they're at least making an effort to respond, respond to people's needs. And I, I worry a little bit uh, that the Brazilian Congress is not doing that and is perceived as being blind and deaf right. in terms of responding to the electorate. How do you see is the situation unfolding there? Mm -hmm. Are they have a risk of a civil war or are they gonna, the regime's gonna become even more entrenched over time? Oh, and what's the impact on Brazil? Because mm. we see a lot of people coming here. Mm -hmm. Border states are under stress. Yeah. Do we have a role as Brazilians in this process? It's a great question. So political scientists, so forecasting the future is really no, hard. No, I know. For uh, economists, it's econ the same, e economists are bad at predicting the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Political scientists are worse. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> We're but, really bad. Uh, um, so we, we cannot predict how this yeah, will end. Looking um, at other experiences. Well, it, it's not even very, um, very helpful in the sense that the, the, the Venezuelan regime is unusual. Okay. It's unusually stubborn. Mm -hmm. So Venezuela has slid into hell uh, now for about five years. Right. Um, it's been in uh, an ex the, the worst economic crisis in the world, the highest level of inflation on earth, mm -hmm. uh, and to the, to the point where a once relatively wealthy society is without electricity, uh, is without toilet paper and, and children are dying in hospitals. I mean, it, and it's been that way for about four years. So it's been at, at what, we, what everybody thinks is the, the worst it can be, the bottom, for four years. Most of the time, we expect that when a crisis like that hits, the government will, and people take to the streets in protest, and they did in Venezuela, most of the time the government quits. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about uh, some of the, the so-called democratic revolutions, whether it's in Egypt or in Tunisia or in Ukraine or Georgia, um, or, or even in democracies like Argentina with De La Rua and the economic crisis, usually things get really bad, people protest, and the government says, okay, that's enough. This government refuses to quit. It's incredibly stubborn. And so most of us expected in 2014, 2015, 2016, Eventually, something had to give. They would, they would give up. Uh, and they haven't. They've been unusually uh, stubborn and unusually cohesive. And so that is dragging the, the, it's dragging the country and now, as you point out, the entire region into mm -hmm. a humanitarian right. crisis of, of the kind that we don't see very often. Um, I think civil war is fairly unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, th this, but this could, clearly could drag out for a while. I mean, if you had asked me Four years ago, I would have said, oh, God, sometime in the next two yeah. years, the regime must fall. It hasn't fallen. So it, it could drag out for a long time. Um, I think it's going to have a couple of things. I think the regime will have a hard time reconsolidating power. I don't think this is Cuba, for example, where they will sort of consolidate a very stable, uh, almost uh, un, you know, untouchable regime. I think this regime is going to continue to be very, very vulnerable. It's very unpopular. Uh, and, um, and it's not going, I can't imagine that it's going to be able to develop the, the kind of economic growth or the resources mm -hmm. necessary to win back public support. Um, so I think it's stuck being very unpopular and very, un, very vulnerable for a long time. I think most likely um, the, the way this regime will die is, or collapse is a split from within. I think eventually there will be, and there have been many efforts at this, but some sector within the regime, possibly within the military, mm -hmm. will rise up and defect and just say, look, this, this can't go on. And so um, it's most like, rather than mass protest, it'll probably be a breakup from within that, that brings down the regime.
What can Brazilians do? I mean, I think um, I've been, uh, I think one of the uh, areas in which the, the PT governments can be most criticized was in their failure to influence the, the Venezuelan government. The PT, the Brazil, because of its size and its strength and the resources that it had and the prestige that it had, particularly under the PT, Brazil had a lot of influence over Venezuela. If there was, um, Brazil was in a much better position than the United States and in a much better position than any other country in Latin America to influence uh, the, the Chavez or the Maduro government. Um, and they were, they didn't do much. Mm -hmm. They did not do much. Now it's, it's very hard for any country, even superpowers like the United States, to influence outcomes in other countries. So there's no guarantee that Brazilian pressure would have succeeded. Mm -hmm. But I do think the Brazilian government could have done more. Uh, now the, 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 the Temer government is so weak and, and has so little legitimacy prior to the next election. Um, and there are so many problems in Brazil itself that it's difficult mm -hmm. to imagine Brazil exerting much influence. But a decade ago, I think Brazil could have done a lot more. Stephen, thank you very much for sitting down with us. Uh, a gente termina aqui a entrevista com o professor Stephen, Stephen Levitsky, autor do livro How Democracy Dies. O livro vai ser lançado no Brasil em setembro, para quem tiver interesse. E fique à vontade para mandar pergunta para nós, para curtir, compartilhar nos nossos vídeos e tocar o sininho aí no YouTube para seguir os nossos vídeos. Obrigado, pessoal. Obrigado. Obrigado.